Hello Internet, my name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. Continuing work today on the drain valve control mechanism for my Pennsylvania A3 switcher locomotive. We've got lots more parts to make, so let's go. Previously we started work on the drain valve control system. This is the system here and we've so far made all of the bell cranks and scotch yokes. The next thing to make then is all of the bracketry and bearings that hold up this end of the linkage. Let's begin by fitting some of those existing parts, what we can anyway, which is just the union links that go on the valve spindles and join the front and rear spindles on each cylinder. The union link is retained by an E-clip on the front spindle, but the rear spindle is held in place just by the scotch yoke that's going to go on the inside of that assembly. You can see that those E-clips look a little wonky, and fun fact, they're actually the wrong size. The whole time I was working on this assembly, I kept Losing those clips, they kept stretching out and falling off and breaking, and I couldn't figure out why. Finally, it hit me. I was using the wrong size. I have like eight different sizes of tiny E-clips in stock for this locomotive, and some of them are pretty hard to tell apart. So that one took me a while, but I was glad to find out I hadn't machined the grooves incorrectly. I just used the wrong fasteners. All right, enough yammering. Let's actually make something. I'll start with the simplest part, which is a shaft that runs across the bottoms of the cylinders and connects the two scotch yokes, and by extension, the two pairs of valves. This is 316 stainless bar stock ground, so I don't have to do much machining on it. I just have to clean up the ends and machine it to length. Now this shaft is going to get a whole bunch of cross pinning done to it. All of the bell cranks and yokes and so on all get cross pinned to this shaft, of course, for strength, but that is going to have to happen later on final assembly. So for now, I'm just facing both ends, cleaning things up, putting chamfers on it, because of course chamfers are what separate us from the animals, and flipping it around and facing it down to length. Random fun fact, I actually made this shaft twice because I made it early on, left it on my bench for a week, forgot that it was a part because it just looked like bar stock, and used it to make some other parts. Next up are a pair of pillow blocks that this shaft rides in, so they act as support and bearings for this shaft. These are made of brass, and I dug through my scrap bin and I found a nice piece of bar stock that looks like it should work. So I'll lop a chunk off of that, and then I'll go over to the shaper and bring this to final outer dimension. These are very simple parts. There's nothing really precision here. The only dimension that really matters is the distance between the bottom surface of the pillow block, or actually the upper surface because they're mounted upside down, and the hole itself that the shaft runs in. Also a good excuse to gain some experience in brass on the shaper. One of the cool things that I'm learning how to do on the shaper is roughing cuts for heavy material removal. The shaper is very good at taking extremely heavy cuts. That's how it compensates for its slowness of traverse effectively. That's how you get efficiency out of it for heavy cuts. So you can see this cut here, I forget exactly what it is, but I think it's 125 thousandths. I think it's an eighth inch depth of cut, which is way more than I would ever do on my little milling machine but the shaper is honestly not even blinking at that. The shaper also benefits from multi-part setups, which is something you typically want to avoid because it's difficult to ensure both parts are clamped sufficiently. But you can see I've got a piece of paper in there which takes up small variations in the surfaces of the parts and ensures they both get clamped and you get big efficiency gains from doing this on the shaper. Next up, I'm going to put the hole in it. So I've gone over to the mill, I've centered up with the edge finder on the machined ends of each block, and I drill and ream those to take that stainless steel shaft that we just made. Because these are both identical, these two pillow blocks, I'm using an end stop to alternate between them. Nice and efficient, saves me a bunch of edge finding. Then while these are still rectangular and easy to hold onto, I'll drill some clearance holes on the bottom, which will become the through mounting holes after the T-shape is cut into this. Incidentally, I used the end stop to rotate this part as well. That's a little secret about end stops that you may not be aware of. It took me a while to figure this one out, that it's a reference for all operations on that axis. So if you're flipping the part on the X axis, then you can use the end stop to again, save yourself an edge finder too. The outer T-shape is cosmetic, so I'll do that on the surface plate with some layout. The actual critical dimensions, as I said, are the centering of the hole and also the centering of the hole relative to the mounting holes. And all of that was done on the milling machine with edge finding and DRO, so that's all accurate. 
I really enjoy layout work. I find it very satisfying. Something about scribing lines in DICAM is just really enjoyable. So I take any excuse I can to do it, really. There is the shape of the two T blocks, essentially. And I will rough cut that out on the bandsaw, get rid of the bulk of that material. I've said this before, but the more hobby milling work I do, the more I try to make every cut a finishing cut. It saves a lot of time. It saves wear on expensive milling cutters. And honestly, I just enjoy it more. The milling machine is serviceable, obviously. It does a lot of jobs that are essential, but I don't really enjoy the time on the mill as much as I do, for example, the lathe or the shaper. All that to say, there's lots of reasons I try to minimize my mill time. Speaking of which, though, I am going to clean up those saw cuts now. I left just enough material with the bandsaw that I can do a single sweep with an end mill down each side and clean up the side and the bottom. This is obviously quite a heavy cutter, a lot of surface contact on the milling cutter, but this is just brass, so even my little milling machine has no trouble with that. I'm talking smack about the milling machine, but that result is excellent, and that was a very quick and easy cut. Now to do the rounded ends, I happen to already have the filing buttons the right size for this shape, so I am going to use them. Filing buttons are kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. The more you make them, the more you already have the size you want the next time you need one, and so you don't have to make them, so you use them because they're there and they're convenient, and then you enjoy using them, and then you make more filing buttons in the future. So I find myself using them more and more. I've also recently learned that filing buttons work great on the die filer. You just take one of them out, set the part down, and presto, die filing tool filing button. Works great. The die filer is just the perfect machine for this kind of thing. Getting in around like the inside corner of that T-shape to finish the curve. It's difficult to get in there with files and do a nice job, but yeah, die filer for the win makes quick work of that. I haven't decided if I'm going to finish these in some way, like I could powder coat them. That would match the rest of the locomotive that I've been doing. I've been powder coating all the brass, but these are also way down underneath the cylinders where you won't ever see them, so I don't know if it's worth the effort. But here you can see how the shaft runs in those blocks, and then all the lift arms and bell cranks and such all attach to this shaft. The next part to make is this funky little bracket that you can see in the corner. This holds the bell crank at the top of the mechanism at the front of the footboards. This is how we make our first 90 degree bend upwards and back towards the cab. So I once again milled out some or shaped up some brass, I guess, on the shaper to outer dimension. And then I'm going to lay out some of the key features on this. The interesting feature is that little groove in the middle of this L bracket. And that groove is clearance for a fastener on the back of a pin that attaches one end of the bell crank. It'll obviously all make sense on final assembly, but that's what that little groove is for. It's just clearance for an E-clip to swing back and forth. I drilled and reamed the hole by edge finding from that lower corner as a reference. And then the rest of this shape is just clearances and cosmetic features. So this hole is really the only critical thing. Well, I guess, and the mounting hole locations. I do want those to be accurately located relative to this hole. So while I'm in this setup, I'll cut that clearance groove. It's not very deep. It is a little bit wider than this nominal size end mill that I have, so I'll do a couple of passes on that. But it was shallow enough that I could do each pass in a single cut, so that was nice. On a small milling machine, it's not often that you get to do things in a single cut, so it's honestly kind of nice when you do. It's one of the reasons that brass is so delightful to work with on small machine tools, because you can get away with a lot more. You can kind of make big girl cuts on these parts. Makes you feel like a tiny A-bomb and or Curtis. Predictably enough, back to the bandsaw to rough out that L shape. Actually occurs to me as I'm narrating this that it would have been fun to do that groove feature on the shaper. I honestly didn't think about it in the moment, and I was already set up after that drilling. I'd already edge found and located everything, so it's just easier to throw a milling cutter in there and keep going. But maybe next time I make a weird bracket like this. I can't imagine ever making this part again, but you know what I mean. Look, the entire format of my channel is just me talking to fill space, okay? Then once again over to the mill to clean up those saw cuts and bring things to final dimension.
It was at this point that I realized I had neglected to do the mounting holes on the bottom. It was, would have been easier to do while it was still square, but I did manage to do a setup for that anyway. As you can see, I've got it balanced on the square head that hasn't been rounded over yet and is still a valid reference, and thus was able to drill those holes. Order of operations does matter, even on the simplest seeming of parts. It always pays to think it through at least a little bit. These simple parts often trip me up because I think they're simple enough that I don't have to think through the order of operations. I can just kind of fly on instinct. But then I get put into weird positions like this where I have to figure out how to fixture an L-shaped part and redo some edge finding and so on to get these holes accurate. The more complicated parts I actually do better on because I go in knowing I'm going to have to think this through carefully, and so I do, and thus make actually fewer mistakes. I guess it's sort of an overconfidence problem. Then once again, the great filing button prophecy hath been fulfilled, and I already had the sizes that I need. On the one hand, it's quite amazingly lucky to already have the buttons, because not only does the outer dimension have to be correct, but the reference hole dimension, the little pin on the end of the filing button, also has to match the situation. However, on a locomotive like this, you know, you've got only a handful of outer dimensions and hole diameters on the entire locomotive. They're all kind of within a certain range, so there's a good chance after you've made a half dozen of them that you're going to get to reuse the ones you've made. And once again, over to the die filer. I don't think I invented using filing buttons on a die filer, but it definitely works. If you haven't heard of it, I'm not going to take credit for this. Let's get that bracket mounted on the footboard so you can see what it looks like. You can see there's a couple of holes that were put in the footboard way back when we made those. Now they get to fulfill their destiny. A couple of shortened screws courtesy of my screw shortening jig that I've shown before. That looks really good on there. Someday that will hold a very important bell crank. The next job then is to get the pillow blocks with that cross shaft mounted on the underside of the frame. They need to go in just the right place so that the scotch yokes engage with the near side valve spindles and operate those. Then the far side valves are operated by the connecting link. Now, the trick is that scotch yoke has to be able to swing back and forth, and the pin of the valve spindle is going to slide up and down inside that yoke, and the range of that has to be just perfect so that it doesn't bind up on the inside and the pin doesn't fall out on the outside. Now, annoyingly, it would be straightforward to calculate what that position should be and thus put those threaded mounting holes for these pillow blocks in the drawings for the frames. And look, I'm going to. I'm going to be unusually honest and straightforward with you here, folks. I am actually genuinely upset that these threaded holes were not marked in the frame drawings. Because now I'm going to have to figure out how to calculate their positions. I'm going to have to either dismantle the entire locomotive to put those threaded holes in there, or set the entire locomotive up in the milling machine somehow to drill and tap these holes. And this all could have been prevented if those threaded holes had just been marked in the frame draw. It... Oh, I see. Yeah, one of the fun things about doing a years-long project is that sometimes you find mistakes that you made two and a half years ago. <sighs> well, at a time like this, sometimes you just have to be the adult and admit that the only rational explanation for this is that a goblin snuck into your shop in the night and altered the drawings. This can't possibly be your fault, right? <laughs> Now I've decided I need to drill and tap these holes with the locomotive assembled. There's no reasonable way to disassemble this whole thing. That would, it would take an entire day to disassemble this thing, and I would lose all of my valve and piston settings, and I would probably damage the powder coat in the process. Some of those parts are actually tapped together, so dismantling and stripping it all the way down to the frame is not practical. That means, however, I don't have any access to references on the frame, such as the ends of the frame rails or other holes in the frame. However, with a lot of arithmetic on the drawings, I was able to determine what the distance should be between the rear edge of the pillow blocks and the front edge of the horn stays. That distance is a little bit tricky to calculate because, of course, dimensions on a part like this are all given from hole diameters, so you have to account for the meat of each part outside of the holes and so on. But amusingly, that turned out to be exactly one inch. Yeah, kind of amazing. 
So I was able to space out the pillow blocks with a stack of gauge blocks off of the horn stays. Then I verified that everything moved correctly and I was pleased to see that it did right off the bat. Everything worked perfectly. So this is clearly the correct or at least a correct location for these blocks. Now I can transfer punch one hole on each block. The secret to success when transferring hole patterns is don't get carried away. Just do one or two holes at a time. Because the blocks are independent, I want one hole in each block. Now I can set this all up in the milling machine. Luckily, my milling machine is big enough that I can fit the entire locomotive on the table. One of the advantages of building in smaller scales is that you can do things like this. And I use the pointy edge of the edge finder to line up on that punch mark and then center drill, drill, and tap these holes. It's always a little nerve-wracking putting holes in your very, very finished parts like this this far into the process. I mean, setting up the entire locomotive upside down on the mill table was uh, not something I loved doing. However, I will say the footboards made that relatively easy. I've got it sitting on a leather sheet as well to protect the finish on the footboards, and I've got machinist jacks under the frame so that the drilling pressure is not going into the footboards, it's just going into the machinist jacks. And this all seemed to go, honestly, perfectly fine. It was nerve-wracking, as I said, but then I put in those two screws, one in each block, verified the mechanism still worked, then transferred the other two holes, drilled and tapped those. Well, that was a nerve-wracking but effective field expedient recovery from an error that I made two-plus years ago, and I gotta say that's looking really good so far. The valve spindles are moving great, the mechanism looks like it's in good shape so far, but lots more to do before this linkage and control assembly is finished, so tune in next time for more. Thank you so much for watching, thanks to my patrons for making this happen every single time. You all are the finest of humans, and I will see you next time.